Okay, I want to speak on the topic this morning, are you ready? And uh, there's a number of things that I want to look at. First of all, are you ready to surrender your life to God? And uh, although that has a primary application to the unsaved, that certainly has an application to many of us professing Christians. Are you ready to witness? Are you ready to do good works? Are you ready to face temptation? Are you ready to suffer for the sake of Christ and the gospel? And then are you ready to die? Is the screen coming through there at the back? Okay. Okay, first and foremost, are you ready to surrender your life to God? It says in Isaiah 55 verse 6, Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is near. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, it says, For he says, in the, ta- in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. <coughs> I came across this and I thought it was very good. You know, man just puts God off all the time and they think that the Lord is going to stand outside the door and knock forever. And one day when they finally open, no longer is the Lord there. I've read accounts, uh, there was a book that I read a good number of years ago where there were accounts of people on their deathbed trying to get right with God and crying out and then swearing and cursing. The danger is that people look at the thief on the cross and they think that everybody's going to have that opportunity. They shun God, they push God aside, they live their own life, and they think one day on their deathbed they're going to get a chance to make right. We don't know what tomorrow holds. Life is very uncertain. Satan's greatest lie is... You have plenty of time to get right with God. But I wonder if the Lord had to show us an hourglass of how much time we've got left, whether that would maybe just change the attitude that we have so often as human beings to just think that, you know, tomorrow is guaranteed. In Acts chapter 26, Festus has got a visitor from, well, King Agrippa, who was the son of Herod the Great, and he's visiting, and Festus decides to get Paul out of prison so that he can come and entertain him and speak in front of King Agrippa. But as Paul is speaking, Festus cries out, You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. Paul replied, what I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things. I can speak freely to him. I am convinced none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. So, I mean, Paul actually says that King Agrippa believes the prophets. He believes in the Old Testament Jewish text. Because remember, King Agrippa was a Jew. He was just ruling under the auspices of the Roman Empire. And then King Agrippa replies with those famous words, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. So I want to ask, are you almost persuaded? There was a song, well there is a song, a hymn, that's called Almost Persuaded. This is the first verse. Almost persuaded now to believe, almost persuaded Christ to, to receive. Seems now my soul, seems now some soul to say, go spirit, go thy way, some more convenient day on thee I'll call. 
Are you waiting for a time that's more convenient before you give your life to Christ? Christian, are you waiting for some time that's more convenient before you really take your commitment to the Lord seriously? Lord, wait until I'm older. Wait until I'm out of school. Wait until I'm married. What's your excuse? What are you waiting for? History tells us quite a bit about King Agrippa. He was the last king of the line of Herod the Great. And he was a Jew, having authority over the population of Jerusalem. He was not always liked by the Jews. And it was rumored that he was involved in an incestuous relationship with his sister Bernice. He and his sister were eventually expelled by the Jews from Jerusalem. And when the Romans marched on the Jews, he sent troops to aid them and even fought on, uh, in the battle on behalf of Rome, being injured in the process. Following the destruction of Jerusalem, he and Bernice moved to Rome, where he was given a new title and new lands. Agrippa died, so far as history knows, never having converted to Christianity. According to the words of the Lord, he died in his sins, and he did not enter into that blessed realm where Christ awaits. There are many, many people who are in much the same position as was King Agrippa. They've heard the gospel preached, but they resist obeying it. When the preacher comes calling, they make vague promises about getting right with God at some future date. Hearing the gospel makes them uncomfortable because they know it's true, and they know it condemns them in their sins. But they don't want to make the changes that Jesus is calling on them to make. They are, in short, almost persuaded. Such individuals may go through, go on to do many things in life, even as Agrippa did. They might fight important battles, earn important honors. They may have success, as the world counts success. But when they die, they'll stand before God. And rather than the words of praise, they will hear the sad final condemnation, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The last verse of this song makes it quite clear that almost persuaded is fully lost. Almost persuaded, harvest is past. Almost persuaded, doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, that bitter wail. Almost, but lost. And as in Jeremiah 8.20, it says, the harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. Now, as we as Christians face uncertainty, and we certainly are living in a time of uncertainty, there are things that we need to ask ourselves. Are we ready? Are we ready for what God wants of us? You know, as we are on our way to the church this morning, I was just saying to Bev that, I was just thinking of that scripture in Matthew 24 where it says, in the last days, the love of many will wax cold. You know, there's a lot of churches closed and they're closed because I know one of the churches, the pastors got COVID. Some of the eldership in Brackpan West have got COVID. Um, even Des has closed. Ten of the people in his church have got COVID. But you know, the fact of the matter is, I can still understand when people stay away because perhaps they're not feeling well and they're sick. But you know, what are we doing with the rest of the week? Are we going to church? Are we going to work every day? Are we having contact with people? I mean, the fact of the matter is, I meet every week at least uh, 15 or more different customers when I go through to Brits and Rustenburg. Every second week I go through to Limpopo and I see 20 to 30 different customers. Um, on Friday I had a funeral for Margaret's eldest son who was shot and killed in an attempted armed robbery. And people you don't know just shake, shake your hand and hello and all the rest. You are put at risk all the time. And uh, what must I do? Sit at home on Sunday because I'm scared that, uh, you know, I might get something. It's one thing if we are afraid, perhaps, of infecting others. But 
I can't imagine the early church having a sort of discussion about how to be careful so that they didn't end up dead. In fact, they stood up in public and preached the gospel, and the majority of Jesus' disciples paid for it with their lives. We've got a job to do. Our job is not just to breathe and to use up air. God's got a purpose for us. Are we going to hide away at home? He's got a purpose for us amongst our work colleagues. He's got a purpose for us amongst our family. He's got a purpose for us in our community. We, we're not just here to, oh, well, you know, I, you know, I managed to reach 90 or 100 or whatever. That's not the blessing of the Lord. Sometimes men that are mightily used by God are cut down in the prime of their life. Jesus died when he was 33. The important thing is not how long you live. The important thing is, have you done what God wants you to do? God's got a purpose for you. We're not here just to, you know, live long lives and, you know, be oxygen thieves. It says in Proverbs 6, verse 6 to 8, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer, gathers her food in the harvest. Now, Christians could read that, and they could decide that this is a time to look after themselves and to buy 5,000 cans of baked beans and to stay away from everybody. We're not called to be doomsday preppers, to hoard up food and hide in bunkers. As Christians, we have a purpose. We have an assignment. We've got a job to do. We do have a ruler. The ants don't have a ruler. They don't have a chief. And yet they wise, they prepare. What preparations are we making for what lies ahead? What preparations are we making for what lies ahead on the horizon as we see the way things are going in the world where governments control people's behaviors, where they can decide whether you can leave your house or not? We mustn't get dragged down by what's going on in the world. We have a king and we are called to represent him. We must rise to the challenges. We are ambassadors. Imagine if the early church just decided, well, you know, this is not on. I mean, I'm not going to be eaten by the lions. You know, I'm just going to hide in my house and wait till Jesus comes. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are Christ's ambassadors. An ambassador is somebody who represents a country. You and I are here as Christians to represent the kingdom of God. What kind of picture do people have of the kingdom of God when they look at you? Representing Christ today requires three basic skills. And these are skills that an ambassador needs. First, Christ's ambassadors need the basic knowledge necessary for the task. They must know the central message of God's kingdom, something about how to respond to the obstacles they encounter on their diplomatic mission. And hopefully you are doing something. If you're a young Christian, and if you're an older Christian, you should have done something long ago. However, it's not enough for followers of Jesus to have an accurately informed mind. Our knowledge must be tempered with the kind of wisdom that makes our message clear and persuasive. This requires the tools of a diplomat, not the weapons of a warrior. Tactical skill rather than brute force. And then thirdly, and finally, our character can make or break our mission. You know, when the South African government chooses somebody to be an ambassador to another country, they choose somebody who's, you know, an example, somebody who can represent the country well, hopefully. I read some article this week where there is millions that is owing to foreign countries to tenants and landlords that have let out their places to foreign diplomats and they've been trashed and they haven't uh, fixed them up. They've left them absolutely trashed. So I'm talking about what should be done, 
I'm not talking about what sometimes is done, but normal countries who want to portray themselves in a good light, they will choose people that represent the country well and behave well. And when you don't, it brings disgrace on the country. And the sad thing is we frown at the way certain people behave who are representing our country. But how are you representing the kingdom of God? What do people think about Christ because of the way you live? Are you ready to witness? 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So always be prepared to give an answer. In other words, you've got to know the word of God. You've got to do your work. And you're supposed to have hope within you. Do you have hope? Or do you overflow with all the negativity that the world overflows with? And then do this with gentleness and respect. We're not here to try and show up and embarrass people of other faiths. So often Christians are good at winning arguments, but they're also good at losing souls. We are called to do this with gentleness and respect. The hope that is within you is what will cause the unbeliever to question you. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope. That verse implies that people are going to say, how come aren't you negative like everyone else? How come aren't you afraid? Look at the terrible things that are happening. Why aren't you hiding at home like the rest of us and hoarding up baked beans? 1 John 3, 2 to 3. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope within them purify themselves as he is pure. So if you've got that hope within you, you should be in the process of becoming more and more like Christ, allowing him to perfect his holiness in you. And that will make you the kind of person that will have an impact as an ambassador. As a Christian, you are a witness. You don't choose to be a witness. The only choice you make is whether to be a bad witness or a good one. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's why you're still drawing breath. That's why you're still alive. God's got a job for you. You are a chosen generation, and the purpose is to show forth the excellencies, to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into light. Are you keeping your spiritual life alive and vibrant with continual teaching and preparation of the Holy Spirit? I'm so grateful for those that do come to Bible college. It's great. And I mean, I've absolutely been blessed. Once again, even, uh, you know, this week, I was saying to Bev, you know, I don't often get into the Old Testament, um, focusing more on the New Testament, but, you know, just going through the prophets and that and seeing how over and over God shows his kindness and his goodness, but people just turned a deaf ear and eventually just brought judgment upon themselves. When you encounter someone who needs to hear your story, and the gospel story. Are you prepared? Would you have to say, oh, well, look, I want you to take you to church on Sunday and then you can hear what the pastor says. You've been serving the Lord for 10, 15, 20 years and you don't even know how to explain your faith. Don't even know how to witness to somebody and lead them to salvation. Do you have a personal story? Do you have a testimony? Did something happen in your life that will have an impact on someone else if you share it? That's one of the most powerful things in your life is your own personal testimony with regards to witnessing. Are you ready to do good works? 
Matthew 5, 13 to 15 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. Okay, so we need to stop hiding under our beds, and we need to get out and do our job. Instead, they put it on its stand, and give it, it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Titus 3.1 says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. Sometimes the most obnoxious people are Christians. But the Bible says we should be subject to the rulers and authorities, except when they tell us to do things which go against God's word. We need to be ready to do whatever is good. 2 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3, Paul speaks about the people that are their converts as their letter of recommendation. You know, if you want to do, if somebody wants a job done and they want it done well, they want a referral. They want a recommendation. When you go for a job application, they want a referral. They want somebody to, to say something good about you. And this is what Paul says. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not in ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. You are a letter from Christ. When people read your life, what kind of light does it put Christ in? Is it something that people say, oh, you're, oh that's something I want? Or is it something that will say people, Phew. as they say so often, if that's what a Christian is, I want nothing to do with it. Is your community, is our community any better off because we are Christians? Do we as Christians do something about the mess that our towns are in, our roads are in? Or is our only contribution to moan about it and to run the government down. We have a situation in uh, Benoni where people in the community go around and they, and they fill up the potholes. They've just taken it upon themselves to do something about it. Bev and I, um, up until not uh, too long ago, we were you know, going for regular walks. And uh, we started it at the lockdown last year. And um, my wife would take a black bag and sometimes quite often she'd fill up a whole black bag just walking around our block. Okay, our block's 3.7 kilometers, but uh, she would put rubber gloves on and all the rest and she would pick up the rubbish. And uh, I at times would join her. And, uh, you know, we, we did something about it. Now, this is something that I want to read to you. And these are Facebook posts from my Afrikaans teacher, from Nigel High School, so he was a number of years older than me. And these are current posts from this month and last month. I actually think, if I'm not mistaken, that he was either the principal or the vice principal of Benoni High. Now, this is not a man who uh, professed to be a Christian. Um, him and I, you know, had a bit of a, a thing at our after party of the matric thing because he tried to force me to drink alcohol and I didn't want and he'd had a bit too much but I mean this guy I want to read some of his posts this is the challenge to all people everywhere let's all do one positive thing to make a difference in our community that will add value pick up one paper in town or on the pavement imagine 20,000 people do only that what a difference this little gesture will make Multiply that by 30 days in the month, and it equates to 6 million. Reminds me of that old song, what a difference a day makes. 24 little hours. Let's make a tiny difference today. Jake Saronio. What a job it was to clean the structure to the entrance to Nigel. Thank you to Aileen and to Niels, to Terence, to everyone who pitched in to help. It's made an enormous difference already. 
The center aisle is nearly completely cleaned and sprayed, but I think all involved can be justifiably proud of the result. Thanks to everyone's efforts in keeping their pavements so beautiful, in removing grass and weeds from these streets. We are winning the fight. There is much to do, but we dare not give up. Nigel is by far the cleanest town in Ikurileni. Thanks to everyone's efforts, we are succeeding. Thank you for the tremendous response and support for Eileen's announcement that she is standing as ward councillor in Nigel. She will be great. And this is a woman who goes around cleaning up the street. And with your support, we'll work hard for our town. Let's support local and local businesses, our local schools, our local charities, our local churches, and each other where it is needed. Jake Steronio, I love Nigel. That's not even a professing Christian, to my knowledge. What kind of contribution do we make? How are we representing Christ? A witness prepares the way for Jesus. And you know, your life and the way you live and the things you do and the way you behave and the way you respond in times of difficulties, that can open a door for a witness or it can close the door. It says in Matthew 3.3, 3, this is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. You and I cannot save anyone. All we can do is prepare the way for Jesus to enter in. People need to prepare the Lord, uh, prepare for the Lord to move in the lives of others. But I see more in this passage of Scripture, and that is that John the Baptist had a job to do, and he did it. He was preparing the way for Jesus. Are you preparing the hearts of people so that when they encounter Jesus, they are ready? The soil of their hearts has been prepared. Now it took 120 years preparing the ark so that God could pour out his judgment on a wicked world. We too have a job to do. Even if there seems to be little or no results, God's word will not return to him void, but it will accomplish his purpose of leading souls to salvation or setting a standard for judgment. Jesus said, I don't judge you. I haven't come to judge the world. He says, the very word that I've spoken will stand in judgment of you. Don't think you're wasting your time when you share God's word with others. And I'm not saying that you need to share it aggressively. As I said, you do it with gentleness and respect. But even if you don't have the results that you would like, Noah went into the ark and all he had was seven other people besides himself and they were family members. But God's got a job for us to do. That's why we're here. Paul's ambition in Romans 15, 20 to 21, he says, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I will not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see. Those, who do not, those that have not heard will understand. This is why I've often been hindered from coming to you. So Paul says to the, Roman, uh, the, the church in, in Rome that he had wanted to come to them and what had hindered him is the fact that he was always ready to go where there was an open door to preach the gospel to people who had never, ever heard. Paul knew he had a job to do. And finally, when his job was finished and his course was run, he had his head chopped off. Are you ready as somebody who's been gifted by God in an in a area of ministry? Paul writes to Timothy and he says, preach the word in 2 Timothy 4. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Be prepared in season and out of season. Not only when it's convenient. Henry Nowen from Time Enough Minister Time enough to minister in leadership gives us an excellent example of being and remaining in a state of preparedness. No one had gone to a monastery for solitude and prayer, 
But while there, he was asked to give a series of lectures to some students. His answer was, why should I spend all my sabbatical time preparing all those lectures? The answer from the abbot came, prepare? You've been a Christian for 40 years, and a few high school students want to have a retreat. Why do you have to prepare? All those years of prayers, worship, scripture reading, and communion with God should have given you enough material for 10 retreats. No one continues. The question you see is not to prepare but to live in a state of ongoing preparedness so that when someone is drowning in the world, you're ready to reach out and to help. Are you ready to face temptation? Do you have the armor of God on? 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. Are we called to serve the Lord only when things are going well? Here, yeah, Peter writes to those that are suffering, and he says, be alert. Be of sober mind. Why? Because Satan knows that most people break under suffering. That's why he wanted to test Job. Because he had been doing this for long enough to know that people say one thing when things are going well, but when things are going tough, suddenly they have a change of mind. But we must do our, we must do our part, and God will do his. In Proverbs 21, 31, it says, The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. Whose job is it to make sure that the horse is ready for battle? That is the soldier's job. But the battle belongs to the Lord. We must prepare the horse, but the Lord wins the battle. So often people say, oh, Lord, do this and Lord, do that, and they want to sit back and do nothing. God save my family. God save my colleagues at work. God do this and God do that. We must prepare the horse. And then God will do his part. Why did Jesus say to people, roll away the stone, when he was going to tell Lazarus to come and to rise from the dead? Couldn't Jesus have just said, stone roll away? Because he wants to show us that we need to do something. It's our job to roll away the stone that is stopping people from being born again, from hearing the life-giving words. But we sometimes are so lazy and so lethargic that we want God to roll, roll the stone away as well as give life to the, the dead in Christ, uh, the, the, the dead uh, sinner. Do you know God's word? The only offensive weapon mentioned in the armor of God is the sword. All the other parts of the armor were defensive. The only offensive weapon mentioned is the sword. 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. Do you know how to handle the word of truth? That's your sword. Do you know the Bible? Have you studied it? Or is the only material that you have what you hear about on a Sunday morning? The word, the sword isn't for your neighbor or for your wife that, uh, or your husband that's not quite doing what you want. Now, that's what people often use the Bible for. They know a couple of scriptures that they can attack other people with. The sword's for you. It's to penetrate your own heart. It's not your sword. It's the sword of the Spirit. The sword is for Satan. Jesus used the sword against Satan. When Satan tried to use the word to tempt him, he stood against him with the, the, the word of God. But never do you find that the word is used to attack your fellow brother and sister in Christ. 
There were various swords that the Roman soldiers had, and there were five different types. I'm not going to mention, uh, go through all of them. The first one was the gladius. It was an, maybe that's where the word gladiator comes from. It was an extremely heavy, broad-shouldered, long-bladed sword. This was the most beautiful of all swords, but because of its weight, it was the most cumbersome and awkward to use. It was referred to as the two-handled sword because it took both hands to use it. Two-handled and, uh, uh, two and swung with all one's might, sharpened on only one edge, the other side was blunt and dull. The history of this sword for the Romans was that after they were terribly beat it, beaten by the Carthagians, they abandoned the use of it to adapt a more easily wielded weapon used in train, it's, uh, although this was still used in training to build up strength. Um, gladius is the Latin word meaning sword, but in its narrow sense, it is referred to as the sword of the ancient Roman foot soldiers. Okay, just some details about it there. Okay, the second weapon was a shorter and narrower sword, approximately 17 inches long. Um, it was much lighter and easier to carry and swing. The third weapon was even shorter, and it looked more like a dagger, and it was carried in a small hidden scabbard beneath the soldier's outer coat, used to inflict a mortal wound in the heart of the enemy. The fourth weapon was a long slender weapon used primarily by the cavalry, like, modern day, like a modern day fencing sword, not a good sword for camp combat. But this, the fifth sword, the machera, machera, okay, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, the type Paul mentions in Ephesians 6. This sword, was a 19-inch weapon, razor-sharp on both sides of the blade, because both sides were razor-sharp. This was the most deadly of all swords. At the end of the sword, the blade was turned upwards, creating a sharp, deadly tip. This sword was des uh, de designed to create a wound far greater than any other sword. The Roman soldier was taught to thrust the sword into his enemy in short stabs, holding the sword with both hands and twisting, wrenching the sword inside the stomach and withdraw the sword with the entrails and the guts of the enemy. It was intended to not only kill the enemy, but also to rip his insides to shreds. It was a weapon of murder. Too graphic? This is what the Holy Spirit gave Paul to use to describe the sword of the Spirit. We are called to equip ourselves with. And this is what it says. Because remember, I told you, God's weapon is to be used against Satan and to be used on our flesh. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates, even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That's what God's sword's supposed to do. It's supposed to rip our insides out, reveal the rottenness that there is within us, the rottenness in our thought life, judging the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart and making us realize how much we need the Lord. We don't need to be equipped the, uh, with the word so much to go and convince everybody else. Sometimes people give their lives to the Lord just based on the way other people live. Christians sometimes make a commitment to God and they've got absolutely almost zero knowledge about the Word of God. They, they make a commitment to the Lord because of the work of the Holy Spirit. It does serve a purpose, but if you had to weigh how much a new convert in general knows, especially people that stay in countries where the, uh, Jesus is not known. 
it pales into insignificance compared to the wealth of Scripture that so many people have in the Western world. And I was thinking about this this morning, and I just thought of those words, to him whom much is given, much will be required. You and I have the word of God at our fingertips. We have it on our computers. We have it on our phones. We, if we don't know the word of God, if we don't study the word of God, it's for no other reason that we have no appetite for it. Because we have it, the availability of God's word is there. Each and every one of us could have a wealth of knowledge of God's word. It's a lack of appetite for it that is the cause of so many Christians in the Western world not even being able to know what they believe or why they believe or, or how to lead someone to Christ. Are you prayed up? That's another one of the weapons that we need to stand against temptation. Jesus, when he returned to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Colossians 4.2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. We need to be ready. The disciples weren't ready when they came to arrest Jesus. They were sleeping. Are you ready for the return of the bridegroom? 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 says, So then, do not sleep as others do, but keep awake and be sober. Matthew 24, 42 and 43, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert, and he would have not allowed his house to be broken into. Luke 12, be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. We all know the story of the five wise virgins, the five foolish virgins, and how they, five of them never had oil. They, they hadn't prepared. Be ready. Be ready when the bridegroom comes. Are you ready to suffer for the sake of Christ and the gospel? John 15, 18 to 25, Jesus said, If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. All it is, as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. Peter says in Peter 2, 19 to 23, For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious to God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Look at Paul's sufferings. 2 Corinthians 11. He says, Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. 
I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled. I've often gone without sleep. I've often known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I've been cold and naked beside everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. I wonder what Paul would have done if he was living in 2021. Do you think he would be sitting at home, being careful that he didn't get COVID? Richard Burumbrandt used to be known as the voice of the underground church because of the suffering he endured in Romania for preaching the gospel. He spent a total of 14 years in prison, three of those in solitary confinement. One day after Richard was released from prison, he took his confirmation class on a field trip. Though it was a Sunday morning, the pastor didn't take the children to the church. He took them to the zoo. Standing before the cage of the lions, he told the boys and the girls how believers in years past had faced such wild animals because of their faith. He shared how they were killed by the powerful jaws of the lions simply because they loved Christ. Why would Richard do this? He wanted these young people to be prepared to suffer to face great suffering. He knew firsthand that believers have to be prepared for persecution ahead of time. Richard observed it's too difficult to prepare yourself for suffering when the communists have put you in prison. Why nobody resists who has not renounced the pleasures of life beforehand. Establish this firmly in your mind now. Life is not about having a safe, comfortable, happy life. Suffering is meant to be part of your life. Whether that suffering is emotional or physical, whether it is light or heavy, if God calls you to great suffering, Embrace it for the glory of God. Don't run from it. You will miss out on something tremendous. What tremendous things await those who suffer? When you begin to focus on the other side of the cross, everything can change. Your focus is primarily on God's glory, and that spotlight breathes a new dimension on suffering. Open Doors International shares about a man named Mikhail Korev, who wrote these words in prison. Lord, if my bonds glorify you more than my freedom, why should I want freedom? Can we identify with a statement like that? When all we want is comfort and ease, and we want to be in the place that's the least dangerous, and everything's just wonderful. And the last thing in our minds is to actually say, Lord, where do you want me? In his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, John Piper says, loss and suffering joyfully accepted for the kingdom of God show the supremacy of God worth more, worth more clearly in the world than all worship and prayer. How can suffering show God's worth more clearly than worship? Think about what would happen at the typical church in America on a hot, sweltering Sunday morning. If the air conditioning stopped working, people would gripe and complain and many would eventually leave. Why? They are willing to worship God in comfort. But when it comes to worshipping in extreme conditions, well, quite honestly, he's not worth that much. How much do you value 
your relationship with the Lord. And folks, we, I think in the past, have never thought that persecution could come our way. But the more and more I see what's happening in the world, the more and more I realize that we as Christians in these last days are going to be called to stand up for what we believe or we're going to be separated like the chaff from the wheat. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The Greek word translated preparing is katagazomai, which literally means to work fully. And by, by implication can mean to perform, accomplish, achieve, work out, produce. In other words, the suffering is preparing or working out or achieving a glory for us beyond all comparison. There is a connection between suffering and the glory experienced in heaven. If we take Paul's words in earnest, it seems that although we will all experience God's glory, we will experience it in different degrees. I've shared this when I've been at funerals. And I've shared it here as well in the past. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, there are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun is one kind of splendor, the moon another, and star differs from star in splendor. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. Star differs from star in splendor. And so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. Eternity will be spent in a certain state. And that state is determined by suffering. That's why anything that really matters goes through the fire. Fire purifies gold. Diamonds are caused by immense pressure. And that's why anything good in our lives will come because of difficulty and how we respond in difficult circumstances. Are you ready not only for suffering, but are you ready perhaps even for death? Paul said that he was ready to go to prison and even to die for the Lord. Being ready like Paul was not just empty words based in pride. Peter boasted that he was ready to die for the Lord and then he denied the Lord three times. Luke 21 says this, keep, be, uh, but keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Be alert. Are we ready? Is what's going on in the world, is it, is it driving into the, us into the presence of God? Is it driving us into the Word? Are we praying? Or are we being the witness He wants us to, do, to be? Because He's got a purpose for our lives. Is what you live in for worth Christ dying for? Did Jesus die just so that you could go to heaven one day? Or does he have a purpose for you? Andrew, the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, was crucified. Bartholomew was beaten then crucified. James, the son of Alphas, was stoned to death. James, son of Zebedee, was beheaded. John was exiled to Patmos, to the mines. Judas, not Iscariot, he was stoned to death. Matthew was speared to death. Peter was crucified upside down. Philip was crucified. Simon was crucified. Thomas was speared to death just this week. I've been listening how Thomas actually took the, the gospel to India and how he was actually killed in India. Matthias stoned to death. This is Paul's statement at the end of his life, and I want to finish with this. 2 Timothy 4, 6-8. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. 
I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but all who have longed for his appearing. I trust, folks, that the Lord would really just stir our hearts to be ready, because we are living in momentous times. <clears throat> 